Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's emergency housing office hours. My name is Lister, and I'll be facilitate, facilitating today's session. This month's office hours is focused on engaging people with lived expertise. Uh, and before we begin the presentation uh, for today, we'll just go over some logistics quickly. This session is being recorded and you can find the recording on HUD's EHV landing page at www.hud.gov slash EHV. And we'll be putting these links um, in the chat that are in the PowerPoint today. Um, all participants are muted. If you're having trouble for any reason connecting to the audio, it is listed there on the slide and we'll also be adding that into the chat. We have enabled both uh, the Q&A box, as well as the chat feature. So for the Q&A, we are hoping that you will use that for very specific questions you have related to EHV for HUD um, or for our presenter today. And for the chat feature, really use that to share your thoughts and experiences on your EHV implementation and uh, specifically for today, how you are engaging people with lived uh, experience in your community. If you are joining today and you are someone who is experiencing homelessness and in need of assistance, we are putting a link in the chat um, to help you find appropriate assistance. Additionally, if you are a victim or survivor of uh, domestic violence or human trafficking and in need of assistance, we will be putting a, a link in the chat there as well. For today's session, we're really hoping to provide some helpful strategies and tips for how to effectively engage people with lived experience in your efforts to end homelessness, including through the implementation of your EHV program. Uh, we have Lauren Leonardis here as our main presenter today. She has worked with a number of communities to bring in voices of people with lived experience into system planning and policy decision-making processes. Um, and so I think you're gonna hear a lot of uh, valuable insights from her uh, today. We'll have time after her presentation for a discussion and Q&A. So again, just wanna remind everyone to feel free to share in that in the chat um, throughout Lauren's presentation on what your community is doing. Uh, even if you feel like you know, you're not where you'd like to be, we really wanna hear what is going on um, in your communities for those attending. So before we um, hand it over to Lauren, I think it would be great if we could just do a, some polling um, to get a sense on um, what is happening um, in your community and at your agency. So this first poll that we're about to launch, what methods are currently being used to engage people with lived experience um, in community efforts to end homelessness? And you just want to check all that apply. Uh, so that could be participating in focus groups or listening sessions, conducting surveys or obtaining written feedback in other ways, have a de designated seat or seats, uh, for people with lived experience on your PHA board or having the same on your COC board, having any designated seats on committees or subcommittees, having an established uh, uh, persons with lived experience advisory council or board. Um, as far as hiring goes, if you've hired people with lived expertise in peer specialist roles, whether you've hired people with lived expertise in program or policy decision-making roles, um, and, you know, you just might not have started uh, being able to formally engage people with lived experience yet, um, and it's okay to, to click that one as well. So we'll give it a few more seconds here. There's a number of you all that haven't um, responded yet, so maybe you're just taking your time to look through, and that's fine. We can give it another minute. Okay, Ari, whenever you think it, you think that most folks have um, been able to respond, you can go ahead and share the results. Okay, so it looks like um, we've got a tie almost. Um, most folks, 39% still have not engaged people with lived experience yet. And so I think that's really great um, that hopefully you'll hear a lot of ways that you can start doing that today. Um, the next highest is 37% um, have 
uh, people with lived experience participating in focus groups or listening sessions. The next two highest are having 24% having designated seat on the COC board, 21% having designated seats on committees, subcommittees, um, and then 16% have high ranked people with lived expertise in peer specialist roles, 5% uh, for having folks in program or policy decision making roles. And then I think the one I missed was 8% uh, designated seats for people lived experience on the PHA board. Okay, so there's a variety of activities happening, but it does seem like there is some room for additional efforts uh, to improve, you know, incorporating of those voices. Can we go ahead and do the next poll, Ari? So what do you see as the biggest challenges to incorporated voices of people with lived experience in your community or agency? If you kind of feel like you're more sitting from an agency perspective, um, then I think it's okay to also respond in that way since it's all kind of very interconnected what's going on at the community level and what's going on at an agency level. Uh, so choose your top three if you can. There's a lot of options there and I'm sure a lot of these challenges are experienced, but we just kind of want to get a sense of what you find, what you think are the biggest challenges, and even for those that haven't haven't done anything yet, um, really around engagement, you know, what do you foresee as the biggest challenges? Close this one out and share. Um, this one's interesting because I think, uh, well, I think a lot, a lot of the similar challenges throughout, and so it, there's not um, the biggest one that is coming ahead is being able to to train um, staff to meaningfully engage people with lived expertise. So that's at fifty percent, but otherwise it's a uh, kind of vary throughout. Um, so these are challenges that exist. And again, I think we're going to hear uh, some strategies today for um, how you can um, you know, try to combat those. Uh, we also had a comment in uh, the chat that there are some tax and employment law challenges around compensating people with lived experience. That's a bigger challenge uh, than funding for us. That's a very interesting um, thing to highlight. So we're going to keep that in mind. Uh, and let's do our, our next our next and final poll. So again, you're going to hear from Lauren today on you know some of the some of the tips and strategies you can use, but just knowing what you know now about how you already are engaging people with ex experience, um, what resources or tools are needed to engage people with lived experience more effectively, and just check all that apply that you think would be helpful. Um, in your community or agency's efforts to um, increase incorporating uh, voices of people with lived experience. I think we can share that whenever you think. Okay, so at 65%, the biggest, the biggest um, tool resource would be funding, followed by online training webinars, um, directives, guidance from, from HUD or PIH, but additional um, community examples sound like those would be helpful, as well as written materials. Um, and if you have other, you know, for those of you that did choose other, if you want to 
um, add in the chat there and kind of what you know you think would be helpful or any at any time throughout this presentation, feel free to do so. Um, so now that we have a better sense of what is going on um, uh, in everyone's community that's joining today and what your kind of needs are and challenges, I am going to go ahead and hand it over um, to uh, Lauren Leonardis to get us started on today's presentation and um, Ari, whenever you have that ready to go. Awesome. Thanks so much, Liz. Um, while I start introducing myself, I want to take a quick second to acknowledge that a bunch of y'all said that training for your staff would be helpful. So I want you to take a quick look at the participants list. If you notice anyone who could be here today isn't here, give them a quick text and say that it's about to get really exciting in here in this office hours. See if they'll pop on over because um, this will be useful information for them. Um, hi, I'm Lauren. I am a consultant. I do subcontracting with TAC, and I've been doing this work for several years. Um, I uh, co-founded the Boston Youth Action Board, and after that, did a lot of work with the state of Massachusetts, supporting communities all over the state to start youth action boards and engage people with the experience. And since then, I've been doing lots of work with HUD on different grants and different projects, mostly YHGP, to help communities um, engage people with lived experience. So I'm excited to be here with y'all today and share some of the things that I have learned. I'll get my next slide, please. Awesome. So I have only two rules here today, in addition to like some standard stuff about respect and being good to each other in general. Um, I want us to have fun talking about this, and I want you to engage and ask questions. I know you can't come off of mute, so give your fingers a quick stretch, get ready to type a bunch in the chat. I'm gonna ask for your participation. Um, I know there's a lot of you, but we'll try our best to keep up and we're gonna have time for questions and answers. Um, I'll ask you to participate throughout, but we'll have some dedicated time for question and answers at the end as well. So jump in as much as you can. Next, please. Cool. Um, first, I want to start by highlighting the importance of engaging people with lived experience. Um, the people who have lived experience can see the gaps that exist in your systems that you just can't and won't. Um, when you're at this from a different angle, you're going to see things that it, it's really difficult when you are looking at it from the perspective of the programming and the staff. So that is one of the biggest reasons, the most important reasons to make sure you're engaging folks because you will miss things if you don't have them there. Um, by making sure you're including people with lived experience, you're gonna improve the effectiveness of programs and policies. And um, just knowing what we know about staffing and what it looks like currently, right? We know that a lot of places struggle to have equitable representation in their service, um, their staff. Is, La, la, la. I can't talk in their staff and it's helpful to make sure that you are being equitable to represent those you serve. Um, so engaging people with lived experience who are a part of your community in all levels of the work from hiring them in a staff um, all the way down to focus groups and just including them in any way you can is going to help improve your services. Um, and then, of course, there's the obvious, like meeting grant requirements. If you're a COC, it does give you points to make sure you're having folks engaged and um, it's just the right thing to do. So next slide. Okay. Um, I did say I wanted y'all to participate as much as possible in the chat. So this is your first opportunity to do so. I'd love to know what keeps you engaged in your work. And TA, if any of y'all are here and you want to chime in too, you're welcome to. Awesome. Relationship building, feeling like I've accomplished something, advocacy for people who otherwise might not have a voice, a sense of purpose. <clears throat> and contribution to improving society outcomes, helping others. Awesome, awesome. Having a purpose to help others, being paid a fair wage. Thank you, Ari, thank you. Uh, what else? I got you, you didn't have to correct it. Um, knowing that 
we are helping youth get housed. Awesome. Y'all are coming up with some great answers. Keep them coming. Improving housing stock in our community while helping families uh, find affordable, safe, decent housing. Fantastic. Awesome. Keep them coming. Um, every day is different and knowing that I'm helping others attain affordable housing. Awesome. So many of y'all have your hearts in the right places here. This is great. Helping others become self-sufficient. I want to ask you to think a little bit more selfishly. Why do y'all have a job? What keeps you engaged for yourselves? What does your job give you? Earning a living and loving what you do. Uh-huh. Have awesome coworkers. What makes your coworkers awesome? Do they provide you anything? Uber Eats. <laughs> Thanks, Liz. Uh, providing financial stability, health insurance. Yes. Helping others and knowing that you can make someone's life easy. Yeah. Um, Nancy says your agency is a great place to work and provides flexibility in work-life balance. Awesome. Affording to live on your own professional and financial growth. That's a fantastic answer. Okay, cool. You guys can keep dumping those in the chat if you want, but I'm going to take us to the next slide. So, Overall, right, I kind of had a feeling that y'all were going to say everything that you said. Um, you said, I need to have a clear, achievable goal to feel good about the work that I'm doing, be supported by my colleagues, be able to grow in my role, be compensated well enough that I don't need to seek another job. Does that pretty much sum up everything y'all said? Yeah? Cool. Um, so then it should come as no surprise that to engage people with lived experience in your community, you need to be able to build a supportive and engaging structure that includes all of those different components. Um, so the ingredients for having a successful engagement in your community is literally everything you just said. Compensation, security and stability, benefits, motivation to make a difference personal core values, professional development, individualized support, achievable goals. So I know what you're probably thinking, and I'll get that next slide, all right? Oops, two next slides. I might have forgot to tell you to go once. Cool. Um, Y'all are at capacity, right? It's really hard to do all of these things for additional people that aren't even part of your staff. Um, I know this and I know that it can be hard, but we're going to talk today about ways that you will be able to um, figure this stuff out and build from whatever capacity you currently have. So let's go to the next slide. And we will start by talking about budget capacity. Um, as folks have already mentioned in the chat before, this is one of the hardest things to get past, um, whether it be because of different barriers involving the rules around it, or whether it's that you just have a small budget and you don't have the financial ability to support this kind of thing. Uh, I want to start by telling you that it is okay to start small. I actually really encourage communities to start really small, because when you just throw a big wide net out there, and I'll talk about this more in a second, um, it's easy to get overwhelmed and to lose track of your goals and to get kind of uh, stuck and not be able to build something sustainable. So building for something sustainable looks like what can you actually support right now? And if y'all want to take a second to answer that in the chat, you're welcome to. It is a little bit of a rhetorical question, but uh, what do you think you can support right now? Just think about that. If you want to answer that in the chat, feel free. So the pros and cons of the cast a wide net method versus the intentional outreach method. When I say cast a wide net method, what I mean is a lot of the time communities will get really excited about the idea of engaging people with lived experience and they'll dive headfirst in and they'll go, okay, we're gonna make a flyer. We're gonna set up a, a focus group date and we're gonna invite everybody who shows up. Maybe this will be like our first board meeting um, and see who wants to get involved. And then we'll just ask them, what do you want to do with this time, right? So a few things I want to suggest. And the first thing is hit the brakes. 
Um, you need to have a plan before you just throw a big wide net out there and invite whoever is willing to show up. Um, you need to know your budget and know what you can actually sustainably support long term. Um, I know that lots of communities start with a really small budget. Like I've had folks reach out to me and go, hey, like we have $5,000 to provide stipends for the whole year. And we want to do X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, okay, hold on. What can we actually afford here? Um, the way that I recommend doing this is to break it down by how much you think you should be able to afford paying someone rather than how can we get as many people involved as quickly as possible. So the intentional outreach method would be um, figuring out your budget to start with, understanding what the living wage is in your area, and um, we'll start with the $5,000, right? If I was to divide that by a living wage and divide that by how many people I think I could involve and divide that by the support that I need to be able to provide to involve those people, um, you would end up figuring out the equation for what you can actually support. Um, for things like YHGP, for example, there the YAB is considered just three people. So I like to throw that information out there because um, it helps folks to remember that they don't have to go and invite eight, nine, 10, however many people all at once. You can start with just three people. I don't recommend going smaller than three people because um, then you are you get into more tokenizing or relying on one person too much or burning folks out and that can get difficult. But if you start with three, right, you build a team, you build space for being able to um, support these three people. You can have some more intentionality around the staff support to give these people what they need to stay involved. Um, and so I want you to be thinking throughout this, how can you be planning for future growth? Again, a rhetorical question, but feel free to answer it if you want to. Let's go to the next slide. Staff capacity. This is the other most difficult thing. Some communities will say, look, we've got the budget, but what we don't have is staff time, or what we don't know how to do is to create a staff position for this. You have to have a staff point of contact, one person whose job it is to support the people with lived experience that you're engaging with. It doesn't matter what level of expertise or involvement the people you're engaging will have. You need to have a point of contact whose job it is to ensure that the people with lived experience that you are bringing into your work and into your team um, are being supported, whether that be like making sure they're copied on emails or providing them preparation time or going over material with them beforehand. If it's just sort of left in the air, then what happens is that nobody does it, right? Um, so that is the number one thing that I want you to take away from here besides everything else. If you wanna engage people with lived experience, have a person create that as part of their job. For communities that have been doing this work for a while and have a bigger budget for this kind of thing, um, I would love to see this as a full-time job. It's like part of somebody's like bigger work that they do is engaging the community, engaging people with lived experience. It can also be a portion of someone's current position. So if you can find a way to just fund some portion of someone's position um, and have them stay in charge of that, then that's fantastic too. We can go to the next slide. Cool. Getting and giving support. Um, so this is where that staff position comes in really important. Again, um, everybody who is new to anything needs support. I can guarantee that none of y'all started on the first day of your jobs knowing how to do what you did, right? So we can't expect that of people with lived experience either. They have expertise, um, but they don't necessarily know all of the things that you know about how these systems are functioning, what the roles are around them. And so you cannot just invite them into your like COC meetings or your team meetings without having that preparation. All of the most important people at your table tend to have a team who is helping to remind them of the important content, going over meetings before them. Sometimes they have assistants, right? Um, and so we can't just ask people with lived experience to like hop in uh, with none of that support. So providing training and supplies that every other employee has access to is going to be a key piece of making sure that your folks can stay engaged. Making time for one-on-one -on -one support for each person with lived experience. So not like a group check-in, but really reaching out individually to the people who you're trying to engage with. 
and going, hey, how is this working for you? Do you need to know anything else? Um, what can I do for you, right? And if you notice that they're not showing up consistently, that's your opportunity to say, what can we do differently? What can I do to support you more? Do we need to move the meeting time, et cetera, right? Um, and I'm gonna keep stressing this over and over, quality over quantity. Don't do the cast the net method. Don't just invite everyone and anyone who will show up. You need to recognize your own capacity and recognize that if you cannot provide one-on-one -on -one support to 10 or so plus people, you cannot do the cast the net method. Understand what your staff, your person who's in charge of this has the capacity to support and make sure you're being really intentional about who you're reaching out to, how many people you're reaching out to, um, so that you can ensure you're creating something sustainable instead of something that just checks a box for right now. Um, and recognize that they are also supporting you. So this support goes both ways. This is not just you like pouring a bunch of effort into someone with this experience. This is them stepping in and giving you this content, this knowledge, this expertise that you don't have access to without them. Y'all need each other to do this work. It is equitable, it is equal, it is um, two different sets of expertise. So it's really important to honor that and recognize that. Um, and lastly, I think I said this before, but I just want to say again that this is not unique to people with lived experience. Any new person who steps into the work needs this kind of support. Cool. So um, this is another chance for y'all to engage. I would love to know what kinds of support can you offer to people with lived experience? In what ways are you making space for and recognizing their support of your work? And how many people do you think you can realistically provide quality support to, including those one-on-ones, prepping for meetings, providing laptops or other supplies? Do folks want to go ahead and answer in the chat? What kinds of support could you offer to people with lived experience? And listen, if you're thinking to yourself, none, this sounds really overwhelming, that's okay too. You should know that there are other people in this space who I am sure are thinking and feeling the same way because it is hard work. Rick says five, that would be your limit. That makes sense, that's a good limit. What kinds of support do you think you could offer to those five people, Rick? What kinds of support do you offer to current staff in your organizations? Reassurance, resources, being a listening ear, weekly supervision. Thank you, Rose, yes. In what ways are we making space for and recognizing their support of our work? Prepping, knowledge sharing, listening, caring, awesome. What about providing meeting space, laptops, supplies, providing training opportunities? Do folks have the capacity to do that kind of thing? Do your current staff get opportunity to train or to get access to supplies?
Cool, we can go to the next slide. So setting achievable goals. Um, there needs to be a set of goals and they need to be achievable. What I mean by that, right, is um, just like you don't wanna just cast a wide net and see whoever will show up, you have to, before you invite anyone into the work, know what you're invite inviting them into. Groups can have lofty and broad mission statements. You can know kind of vaguely like, yes, I would like to end homelessness. I would like to provide housing. I would like to whatever. But without specific goals, it won't be clear what you're asking for or how people can actually take action. So making sure that you know what you're asking folks into is the, the most important first step. And that can change, right? We want people with lived experience to help set those goals, but you still need to know what are the boundaries, what are the realistic expectations. Otherwise, um, people with lived experience will come into the work and they won't, they'll be throwing out ideas left and right that you don't actually have the ability to help them achieve. So understanding what the goals are, what are the achievable goals that you can set together is really important. Um, creating bite-sized goals that build towards something bigger. Um, like when you make some kind of an action plan, again, you can't just say, we're going to end homelessness. You have to come up with all the different ingredients along the way. Um, otherwise, folks get burnt out and they don't feel like they're achieving anything. Um, you want to be able to have small successes along the way and be able to say, yeah, we did it. We did this part. We're going to do the next part now. Uh, a clear understanding of access to power and decision making. So this piece is extremely important. Um, if you invite people to the table and you don't tell them what access to power they have, then they're going to be throwing out ideas that again, they can't actually achieve. Um, an example that I'll use, right? So when I used to run the Boston Youth Action Board, um, I had a young person come to the meetings and say, well, why don't we as the YAB buy up all the empty buildings in the city and we could just provide housing. We could run the program ourselves. And someone could go, oh yeah, that's a good idea. I'll write it down in the notes and never do anything with it because it's not actually achievable, right? Or they could be really transparent and have a very clear understanding of what the group's limits are, what access to power I have, what access to power I am able to grant the, the people in the group that I'm running. Um, to be able to set the clear boundaries so that they can actually come up with something that is achievable. So in that case, right, I was able to say, we don't have the ability to do that. It's not within our lane, our funding, our anything really. Um, but what we could do is uh, come up with some kind of a training or content to help train housing providers in our area to kind of get at some of the need to improve housing. Um, money is power what goals can the people with lived experience board actually afford? Similar to what I was saying before, right? You need to explain the budget and explain your access to money to the, the board that you're working with. If you say things like, no, we can't afford that. No, we can't do that. It's outside of our scope. It's outside of our budget. But you don't actually explain what the budget is. You don't actually train folks on how they can engage with the budget. You're just going to leave folks feeling frustrated because they're not going to be able to create realistic goals with you. So you need to be willing to be far more transparent with your budget with the people that you are actually working with so that they can come to solutions with you. Like if you say like, look, we really can't afford this. Here's what we have to work with. Um, they now have the opportunity to come up with something creative with you rather than just to feel frustrated that they can't come up with what they wanted to. Next slide. Again, this is an opportunity for you to engage on setting achievable goals. So what are some examples of goals that your community has set? And again, TA, I welcome you to pop in some examples as well. Sylvia has said um, employment and housing. What specific goals around employment and housing are there? Like, is it get 100% of people housed? Is it improve employment options? 
Access to computer and Wi-Fi. Yeah, that's a good one. How have you worked towards these goals? That's a great specific goal, Sylvia. So having permanent housing within 60 days. Are there ways that you can include people with lived experience in the process of designing something that creates that outcome? How could you be working with people with lived experience to create those outcomes? Well, I'll talk about this a little bit in the next slide so we can go to that next one. Um, oh yes, yeah, smart goals and action plans, yes. So creating a structure for growth. Um, people with lived experience are leadership partners in this work. They're not just folks that we're serving. They're folks that can actually bring leadership and bring expertise into your work. So building in and building up leadership is how you make this possible. Making sure that you are creating a supportive environment um, allows leaders to emerge and take up space in this work. Um, ending homelessness takes leadership from people with all different kinds of backgrounds and expertise. So if you don't have people with lived experience to fill those roles yet, the existing staff supporter's primary job is to build up the capacity of people with lived experience who can and want to take up those leadership roles. So again, when I was talking before about making sure that you have a specific staff person who it's built into their job to be supporting people with lived experience, um, that staff person's job is to be building up the leadership of the people they're working with. Ideally, right, they'll just be working with the three to five uh, folks that you're able to bring in to start with, and they'll be supporting them to learn how to do some of the budgeting themselves, to learn how to create these action plans and goals, learn how to um, engage with the community, maybe even facilitate. Um, it's really about understanding the skill sets that people bring to the table and understanding how to build those things up. Again, in the same way that you would with your other staff in supervision meetings, in support meetings, in trainings that you have with your staff currently on board, you want to be building leaders. Um, commonly, orgs will struggle to figure out how to do this because they don't want to hire people with lived experience. So I just want to say um, hire people with lived experience. Don't build glass ceilings, build opportunities for growth, and put your money where your values are. Um, so no otherizing people and creating some weird like, oh, you can get a stipend or you can be an employee. You can't be something different in between. Um, so let me see, where was I? Um, quality over quantity. Again, I've said this a bunch of times before, making sure that you're building leadership means not overwhelming yourselves. You can't invite 10 plus people in because it'll stretch your budget too thin and it won't allow you to provide the support that you need to structure for growth. Ideally, if you're creating some kind of a board for people with lived experience, if not now, eventually it will be run by people with lived experience. So being able to pour that support into the individuals who you're currently working with means that you need to have quality connections and build something sustainable rather than just um, letting people come and go and having it be super fluid because you won't build leadership that way. Um, and when things aren't working out well, you need to be willing to take feedback and change the structure according to your community's needs. So be very responsive to the folks that you're engaging with. Different people with lived experience will need different kinds of support in order to engage in different amounts. Um, so you need to be willing to make changes to this and don't live by your contract. When I say don't live by your contract, I mean, um, a lot of the time, right, you get specific kinds of funding to support this work. 
you need to be able to make sure you can go to your funders who are working with you on this and say, look, like this board structure, it's not meeting our needs right now. We need to change things. We know it's written into our contract this way, but uh, we need to try something different to make sure folks can stay engaged. So be willing to advocate for that. Be willing to be flexible because working with people with lived experience requires flexibility. Next slide. So I've got a few more questions for folks to mull over again. Uh, what does it, people with lived experience leadership look like currently in your community? I know that earlier in the polls that Liz did, there were some folks who said you had folks in certain leadership positions already. If any of y'all want to share what that looks like in the chat, that would be great. I know some folks said that they hired people with lived experience to lead a committee or other positions. And it's okay if you don't have answers to some of these things right now, but I want you to make sure you're thinking about these things when you go and you make plans to engage folks. So um, how are you or how could you be connecting people with lived experience to additional opportunities? Because when I'm building up leaders, right, when I'm working with people that I am trying to pour into and make sure they are developing and their professional growth is happening, I don't expect them necessarily to stay working with me for forever. I want to be building a stronger community and I want to be building leaders who can then take those skills and go make changes in other parts of the community as well. So thinking about additional opportunities that you can be uh, helping folks connect to outside of just this work that you're doing is always fantastic. And what happens when people with lived experience move on from your work together? Um, are there other opportunities for them elsewhere? We can go to the next slide. Okay, let's talk a little bit about compensation real quick. So um, it doesn't matter how important the job is. I know earlier, lots of y'all said that what keeps you engaged is caring about your job and wanting to make a difference. Um, however, if y'all didn't get paid, would you still show up to your job? Feel free to answer in the chat, just yes or no. Who would be here right now if they weren't being paid? Who would be here right now if you weren't being paid as well as something else might pay you? What about if I threw pizza and a Best Buy gift card in there for you? No? No. Um, you can't prioritize this kind of work no matter how important it is, no matter how much you care about it, no matter how much your values are behind it, if you are not um, getting paid well. So making sure that if you want to build something sustainable, you are recognizing that you wouldn't be here without regular consistent pay. Don't ask people with lived experience to show up for this without regular consistent pay. Because what will happen, right, is if you only have a once a month meeting or whatever schedule meeting and you're expecting people to show up consistently, they won't. They won't. You need to create space for something that is consistent and reliable something that, if possible, provides benefits, something that provides professional development and growth. Because if you can't provide those things, they will not come back. They will have to go and meet their needs elsewhere. And so if you, like I said before, right, put your value, put your money where your values are. If you value having lived experience in the work, then put the money down on the table and pay people like you mean it. Um, if you just want to check a box, then I guess keep doing all the other things that I don't think you should be doing. So next up, right, understanding the difference between consultants and contractors versus employees. Um, I want to preface this piece with that I am not a tax expert. I have just been doing this work for a long enough time to know that this is really important. And I know y'all are all over the country, so I really want to encourage you to look up the laws in your state, in your community, because I do know they vary a little bit. But the number one rule that uh, I know is across the board, once you pay someone over $600, 
um, you have to report that to the IRS through a 1099, which is like a consultant or contractor form. When you get a 1099, your taxes are not withheld. Uh, you don't get any benefits. And you are actually not allowed to be providing folks training. If you're calling them a consultant, they need to come with all of the skills already preloaded into their expertise. Um, and what it means is a lot of communities are like, oh, well, it's easier if I'm stipending people for the work. Like, we don't have to do all this paperwork. They don't have to do a W-9. I can just kind of give them a gift card and call it a day. But even things like gift cards count towards the $600 limit. Um, and it actually doesn't make it easier for anyone. All you're actually doing is shifting the burden to the people who are already more burdened. So I want you to recognize that somebody is still going to have to be doing that tax information. Somebody is still going to have to be paying those taxes. And it's going to be the person with lived experience if you haven't set this up in a way that is actually equitable and, um, and fair. So my uh, best practice recommendation for you is that you create a job position. If you want people to stay uh, sustainably and consistently, create a job position. It doesn't have to be full time. It doesn't have to be uh, lots and lots of hours, but creating a job position that puts that tax money aside for them, allows them to attend staff trainings, to use staff resources, um, to have some kind of a more stable expectation for what they're they're looking for, what you're looking for. Um, these things are all going to be really important in consistently engaging people with lived experience. Um, and there are communities all over the country who've started doing it this way. So you wouldn't be the first. You'd be able to find resources on this. But it is absolutely considered the best practice now not to be giving folks 1099s, not to be stymieting them or giving them gift cards, because at the end of the day, it does just bite them in the butt instead of you. Um, additionally, down the line, if the IRS ever found out that somebody looked like they should have been an employee but were not employed, um, you can get a huge slap on the wrist for that too. It is super illegal, and not only will that person with lived experience have to still pay the taxes, but your organization will get in trouble as well, especially if you're in California. They have the strictest laws in the country. Um, next slide, please. So again, a few questions for those of you who have already been doing some of these things. Um, how and how much are you paying people with lived experience currently? If you're willing to share that in the chat, that would be great to see a little bit of a range of what folks are currently doing. And what challenges have you run into with paying people with lived experience? And how can you improve your compensation structure to create stability for people to engage long term? Um, Robert, I see your comment here, and uh, I I have a quick suggestion that I want to give you for that. So you said you're a government employee at an agency, and creating jobs within the government can be difficult for this kind of work. Um, I would suggest you look for a host agency and perhaps fund that agency to create and support these job positions instead. Um, if that's something on the table, what that would look like is that the government agency contracts with a different organization, perhaps something that has a drop-in center or runs a shelter or has staff who are experienced in working with people with lived experience already on their staff. And then that organization could create those job positions instead of housing it under the government. Penny says, I know how to provide benefits counseling to people receiving social security stuff and how employment would affect their benefits. Yeah, that's a really important piece as well. Um, so to Penny's point, right, if we're engaging with folks who get different um, cash assistance, social security, food stamps, things like that, um, we know that giving them a job, paying them is going to sometimes negatively affect those benefits that they're receiving. And so what I'm going to say, right, is make sure you're creating a position that would offset that enough. 
Don't be paying someone scraps knowing that it is going to actually take food out of their mouths. Create a position that actually provides them with enough support and stability that if it did take away from those benefits, it would be okay because they're doing work that they're capable of doing. They're being supported and um, they're being paid enough money that it's offsetting whatever it's taking away from their other services. Well, we can go to the next slide, which is just a funny little gif that I like. Um, so we can go to the next one. Okay. Um, I can take questions now if folks have them. Lauren, while we wait to see if folks have any uh, specific questions, you've already answered a bunch. Um, so that's really helpful. And I think um, everyone's been really good about uh, entering information in the chat. And I think some of these, some of these, these are very nuanced things that can come up and we will be taking uh, some of the things that have been highlighted here back to HUD to see if, you know, if there is any additional guidance that um, can be provided. Um, I know we have um, with us today another TA provider, Allison Court, who's on our team, and she works directly with um, the city of Baltimore uh, for their EHV program, and they have done a lot of good work in this area. And I was just wondering, Allison, if you might just be able to just to kind of bring, um, you know, a good community example forward that is related to EHV, you wouldn't mind just talking a little bit about what they do. I know they weren't able to um, participate today, but I think it would be great if you could just share um, just, you know, a summary of kind of what you know that they're doing there. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So hi, everyone. Uh, Allison Cordy, she, her pronouns with TAC, uh, also part of the EHV leadership team. Uh, also, I've lived with experience of homelessness, identify as Black mixed race, and just based outside of Philadelphia and Delaware County uh, in Pennsylvania on Lenape land. So I'm also one of the S1 coaches for Baltimore. And so when I first kind of stepped into the TA world, um, the Housing Authority and the CSC were in the process of developing the MOU for the EHV program. And there are a series of joint meetings uh, that included the Lived Experience Advisory Committee or the LEAC and the Youth Action Board or the YAB. And that led to the prioritization of vouchers for youth households and uh, additional referrals from street in shelter. But um, I should first mention that, um, so there are members of the LEAC and the YAB that serve on the COC board. And I think just about every COC committee, uh, as well as the executive committee. Uh, and uh, one of the LEAC members is actually the co-chair for the COC. So their structure, it varies how many seats are dedicated for folks with lived experience, but there are at least six going up to as many as eight, kind of depending on the, the composition of the board at the time. Um, and the city also has dedicated staff that serve as the liaison for the lived experience advisory committee as well as the YAB and it's part of their job description. So I think one of the things I'd highlight from the MOU development uh, process was how the quality of the relationships across the various partners really improved. So initially my understanding is there wasn't a lot of collaboration uh, and the introduction of EHVs for, into the community really forced the need to build the relationships to allow the trust to grow. Um, the conversations weren't always easy, so I'm not going to sugarcoat that, but the trust, right, really needed to be built, um, and the silos, like, broken down. And so, like, what do I mean by the silos? So, like, initial conversations, uh, like, were brought to standing committee meetings of, like, just the LEAC and, like, just the Youth Action Board separately, but pretty quickly it was determined that, like, that way of operating was just not going to work. And so, right, incorporating folks from, from those, um, the lived experience groups into those decision-making meetings jointly, right, um, really ensure that folks weren't left out of the process due to like how quickly things needed to get developed. Um, another thing I'd highlight, I think, of what I've observed in the community is, is um, really around how the communication changed. So I think one thing that can play out uh, in community is just misunderstanding, right, around intentions or even what people are actually talking about. And so I think something that's changed is how the partners communicate with one another. So for example, 
Um, during the MOU development process, like the LEAC and the YAB really uplifted the need to ensure that vouchers were used to prevent returns to homelessness, because from that perspective, they, that's what those groups were seeing a lot of. And after reviewing both uh, some of the data that was available, I think both sides were able to agree, right? Preventing returns to homelessness was actually a secondary priority use for the voucher. So kind of uplifting what Lauren was talking about is that perspective shift, is you have this kind of an initial kind of assumption, right, of what's going on and getting that extra layer of perspective. Um, really guides the work forwards. Um, I think further, I'd say uh, I'd also uplift that like this level of partnership really opened the door. Um, I think to include folks with lived experience, um, not only from the advisory committee and the Youth Action Board, but for example, as well as youth who are not formal members of the Youth Action Board in other programmatic areas. So the city also has a number of other partners like the Homeless Persons Representation Project that have also been really helpful in like hosting meeting spaces, providing compensation, uh, as well as some other uh, like refreshments and stuff for meetings. Um, but I think right to the another point that Lauren made, um, I was on a call earlier today actually with Baltimore debriefing after a youth feedback session on a new set of program standards and the need to really provide that kind of care to support folks who are asked to share their personal experiences during the conversations as well as provide the aftercare. Um, so like we're not just soliciting feedback or engaging in these really transactional um, relationships Relationships with folks like tell us about your experience in the program oh that sounds tra traumatizing here's fifty dollars thanks like so the need right to as we kind of go back to the youth kind of present the, the feedback solicited and incorporated in this new set of program standards will now be able to provide community healers as well as a designated staff person who will be part of the session to invite folks to like talk more right or share talk through some additional resources and provide additional space just to be able to kind of process through that uh, and not just in that kind of like one and a half hour session, right? Um, so I think that's something that's really um, kind of been, uh, the community's really embraced that I've noticed. Um, and I think in responding to what are some of the goals the community has set, I would say it's it's around just getting more participation from folks with lived experience in more areas. So like, what does that mean? I think it means right being transparent in all the decision making processes in decision making spaces and like getting input early and often and highlighting how feedback has been incorporated into policies and procedures and really pushing that like annoying little voice that says, oh, we can't do that. Like then to be like, how can we make it fit in? Uh, and so it's been really exciting uh, just in like the year and a half or so that I've been working with Baltimore to really see that that process. Um, and I, I guess I'll end by saying um, there continues to be ongoing discussions right on utilization of EHV vouchers, for example, amongst these those partners to see if changes are needed on any of the priority populations like as vouchers kind of turn over. Um, and those conversations, I would say, would have been very difficult before the relationships had been built and tested um, and, and like the space is really adequately prepared. So I'm going to drop into the, sh the chat for folks. Uh, just the links to the Baltimore Lived Experience Advisory Committee, as well as their Youth Action Board as well. So you can see a little bit more about kind of the composition um, of, of how folks with lived experience really participate in, in those processes. So um, I know we're short on time, so I'll end there. Thanks so much. Thanks, Allison. And, um, you know, I think hopefully in the future we'll be able to have more community examples and um presenters from communities to talk about this more. Um, Lauren, we only have a couple minutes left, but I thought um, maybe we could let you just, um, you know, one of the questions I had thought to ask, uh, which is kind of get your sense of like what you've seen as, um, you know, shifts in this space over time since you've been working a while, kind of get your thoughts there. And if you want to leave anything uh, with this group today that you'd definitely like them to take home with them, um, now is your time to do so. Thanks so much, Liz. Um, yeah, that time just flew by. I think one of the biggest shifts that I've seen kind of comes back to that piece about how we're paying people. Early on in this work, I think that we all jumped right to like, let's stipend people, let's get the money in their hands immediately. And I think that was the right answer at the time, right? Um, as we move forward and we all learned collectively in this movement, that that was not actually meeting young people. Well, I say young people because my work comes from Youth Action Board stuff mostly, but anybody's needs. Um, 
that is where this shift into the best practice of employing people, giving them a position, creating more uh, stability around this work has come from. Um, because I think that there is this need to create flexibility and the freeness that the original method allowed, but there needs to be that flexibility and freeness within a structure that still meets people's needs. So shifting into um, getting people hired, making sure that their needs are met in this work, uh, that allows folks to stick around. We wanna see folks staying around long-term. We don't wanna see them show up for a few months and then disappear when the work has burnt them out. Um, I think that's my big takeaway. Uh, well, thank you, Lauren, so much for all the helpful information today and Allison for sharing that community example. Um, I'll just wrap things up quickly. If you notice in the chat, we added a bunch of different resources that you can go to learn more about um, uh, how to incorporate voices of people with lived expertise um, that HUD has put out. Uh, don't forget that we are now having these office hours monthly. Our next one um, in December is going to be focused on celebrating EHV successes. And if you do need any, if you have any questions or would like TA, you can go to um, the HUD exchange to request TA and also submit questions through the AAQ. Uh, so thanks everyone for joining today and for being um, so chatty. We love that. I uh, hope everyone has a great day and see you next month.